second day of the school. And uh, so I will continue uh, our lectures on population uh, dynamics. And the subject today will be uh, interacting species. So just to remind you, yesterday we studied the dynamics of, uh, of only one species. And uh, we saw the concepts of, uh, of, uh, of, of the logistic uh, equation and, uh, and what is the carrying capacity. Oh, okay. So, okay. So yesterday we saw the logistic equation, essentially. And uh, we saw that we could uh, solve, actually, the equation, the logistic equation. And then I told you that this was a particular case, that you could not solve most of the other equations that will appear in population ecology. There are such things like uh, um, qualitative analysis of differential equations and numerical integrations. So we will now we will uh, go for interacting species and we will deal with systems that have no, no explicit solutions. So we will have to extract information in some different way. Come on. Ah, okay. So the topics are interacting species, but well, there are many kinds of interactions. We will study one particular today, which is uh, predation. Huh? And we will see the most, uh, uh, the oldest uh, model of interacting species, which is the lotka volterra equations, and then we will go a little bit beyond lotka volterra equations and uh, discuss the glory and misery of lotka volterra equation. And then we can give more and more steps beyond the lotka volterra, far beyond the lotka volterra equations, and have some final comments. So. Interacting species. So interaction is widespread in nature, and uh, all species uh, uh, interact in some way. And uh, actually, species live in interaction networks. Right? So there are many species interacting, and so on. So in order to study this, and uh, uh, as I told you yesterday, it's th you, you, there's a kind of there must be a trade-off between generality, on one side, and uh, realism. So, uh, realism would say, take the whole network and try to obtain some information which is uh, maybe useful or build theory about networks. Uh, this is also something that people can do which is networks of theory applied to ecology, to ecology people that's a research area. But we follow the classical path and say, no, let us, we have studied one species, and now we will study uh, the simplest cases with just two species. Right? And then, we, and why is this useful? Even if you are interested in the networks, because when you draw a network of interacting species, you have species one, species two, species three, species four, then you make thing, things like that, okay? S saying this is, these two are interacting, these two are interacting, this is all. So the interaction is pairwise, okay? Anyhow. So even if you have a network, usually networks are composed of pairwise interactions. Therefore, we will study the interactions the pairwise interactions first. Okay? Then you can go for further things. Okay? This is not the only thing, uh, just from as, a, as a more advanced topic. Uh, there can be uh, interactions which are not pairwise. This is called higher order interactions, and this is a topic of study of that people study nowadays. There's no <laughs> No final, I mean, is it important or not? This is being still discussed today. So we'll go for pairwise. So, <coughs> so there are many 
kinds of interactions. So let me do this on the blackboards better than that's my. Uh, and we will <coughs> make a classification of of interactions according to the effect on the populations. So we are doing something that's called population dynamics. We are not looking at individual interactions. So at the point, at the point of the view of the populations. So the interactions can be classified as being positive or negative in the sense that the interaction increases the population or, de or tends to decrease the population. So you have two, two species, let's call it species A and species B, and say they are interacting. So this could be like that. The interaction is detrimental for A. And it's also detrimental for B. So this would be called competition. If you have, this will be the topic of, of the lecture of, uh, uh, um, of, uh, 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 of tomorrow. We will study competition tomorrow. So the idea is that if you have, uh, competition is very complicated from a conceptual point of view. But mathematically, it's, it's, it's easy, but conceptually, what is competition is like, uh, uh, we will discuss this and how it's usually mediated by resources. The competition is for something, say the resources. Okay? So if uh, the population A increases, consumes more resources, there are less resources for population B, and vice versa. Therefore, it's detrimental for both of them. And then that's what we call competition. Okay? So it could be positive, incremental for one of the populations, and negative for the other one. And we will call this predation. But this is more than predation from the biological point of view. Okay? because there are many interactions that are positive and negative, and they can be studied mathematically under the same framework, but they represent biological different interactions. And one thing is that predation that you can say, uh, go, and, and, uh, go to Animal Planet and see the, the lion eating the zebra. This is predation. Right? But there are other interactions that, that are not like that. For instance, there is... Um, uh, Parasitoidism. There is a parasite, and there is a host. The parasite puts, say, uh, eggs in the host. The eggs then uh, grow inside the host, kill the host, and then they hatch, and you have a new parasite, uh, uh, a new new insect. So this is this goes under predation here for our purposes, because it's positive for the parasit uh, parasite. And it's negative for the host. Okay? So, but it's you see, it's a different biological uh, 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 phenomena than just the predation, like uh, the usual things that you can think about predation. So there, are, there is a host of re uh, different interaction which can be put under this umbrella of the. This, this is this is a very crude way of classifying interactions. Okay, so. There's a, bi a biological diversity of ways that species interact, and we are just now kind of, of, of not looking at this diversity, and we are classifying them in, into classes, and we will build models that are, in principle, valid for the whole class. Okay? Therefore, these models that we will build are not very realistic because they don't take into account a lot of biological information that you could have if you take into account the, the real, real situations, but will have give us, on the other hand, general results and general patterns that we expect to observe when you have this kind of interactions in nature. And finally, there is the plus-plus one, which is called 
mutualism, which is the, the only interaction that, I mean, the only not, but the, it's an interaction that we will not study. Right? Why? Well, first, we have only one week, and I have, we have to choose what, what to study. That, that's uh, the main reason. And um, mutualism is interesting. Mutualism, there, there are essentially two, two different aspects of mutualism. I mean, or symb symbiosis can also be under mutualism. Okay? Uh, if if it's it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, mutualism, if it's uh, um, um, obligatory or not. I mean, if if a species has a mutualistic interaction, but it doesn't need this interaction, it just gives you some plus. Okay, so this is typically ecologically, yeah, okay. You don't need even to write the equations. You just say, okay, the, there will be a higher, um, a, a larger number of individuals, and that's it. So there's no, no anything. Uh, there's no fun. But when it is obligatory, when when a species needs the other, other, other species in a mutualistic relation to b sustain, to exist, then it becomes much more interesting. And usually, m models of mutualism are much more interesting when put into mutualism in networks, the effect of mutualism in networks and so on. So here today, we won't study mutualism, OK? So then, obviously, you could have a zero here also, OK? Something that affects only one species or not. So we, we don't want to go into all these details. I, I have actually uh, written this somewhere here which is, uh, is uh, amensalism, which is negative for one species, neutral for the other, and then there's a commensalism, and uh, then there's neutralism, which is an interaction that has no effect. Okay. From the population point of view, it, it is interaction at the individual in the, uh, level, but it's not, uh, has no effect on the increase or decrease of the population, so that's neutralism. So, okay, this is things that are details. We, we will be focusing essentially on the uh, predation today and competition tomorrow because they have very important uh, results of the mathematical biology and the, the building of theory in ecology and in epidemiology is, is largely um, based on these interactions. So, predation, which is widespread, huh? and it's a direct interaction. So, let me stress again this. So, as I told you, we can look at interactions at individual level or at the population level. Okay? What actually you could say exists is it's the lower level, the individuals. Okay? So, and, the, and what happens to the individuals will have some, some consequences for the population. Okay? But here we are not looking at, it. we are not studying uh, individuals, we are studying just the populations. Okay? But it is important to remember that predation can be observed as an actual interaction. Yes? And you can go to the field and see predation happening. So it's a direct interaction. I'm stressing this because tomorrow we will talk about competition, which is not usually a direct uh, uh, interaction. It's mediated by resources or something else. So competition, uh, predation is direct interaction. So we can, it means that we will be able to build mechanistic models. So. Let us put, let us describe the, the most simple ideas about how to build a model for predation. First, you need two species. So, uh, yesterday we had only one species, which I, I denoted by a function n that depends on time. Okay? Now we need two. Okay? We need two, two populations, we need two functions, and we will have two equations. And the equations will be coupled. OK? 
Okay? So let's see. Okay, this will be the Lotka Volterra model. Ah, okay, there's some illustration. You can read this uh, then on the website. Uh, very nice stories about these guys. They're fabulous guys. Uh, mo uh, just <laughs> one minute of, sto of history. Uh, uh, Volterra is a very important mathematician. Okay? He is very, very famous. He has books on integral equation, on, on real, real, real math, pure math things. And uh, uh, he gives some con give this contribution. There's a whole story about meeting a guy at the, at the, at the, uh, uh, um, uh, this guy worked with uh, fisheries in Italy, and there were oscillation in the, in the fish uh, stocks. And so he went on to try to understand because the oscillation were not of the period of one year. If it's one year, usually when you have an oscillation of period of one year, you say, oh, that's a seasonal. But so he tried to find a model to explain the oscillations. You will see that oscillation will come into play in, in a minute. And uh, so, and, uh, and he was, was a very important mathematician. He also was a resistant against the fascism in Italy. Uh, and Alfred Lotka is a very, <laughs> it's an American born in Ukraine. Okay. Yeah. And he was all around in Europe, and, and actually he studied his, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, about what would be masters in, in Scotland or England. I don't, I don't remember exactly. And, and the physicist will remember uh, the, the name of his uh, advisor at this point, which is a guy that uh, only physicists have heard about, which is the Mr. Pointing. There's the pointing vector in electromagnetism. So this guy was uh, one of the supervisors of Lotka, but Lotka then moved to Germany and studied uh, uh, chemical, uh, 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 physical chemistry with, with a guy called Ostwald, which is a very important guy to describe reactions between uh, uh, chemical species. Chemical, okay? Oswald was very important and is the last important scientist who, during a part of his life, did not accept the atomic hypothesis. And then he got convinced at a certain point. It was not atomistic. And working, you know, now you remember kind of, yeah, there's you know, they have chemical reactions, and so actually Lotka thought about going to biological things in, in a parallel with, with uh, uh, physical chemistry, with reactions of species, of, of, um, of chemicals, uh, chemical elements, and uh, make, make this as an analogy to... Uh, to biological species, and this is, that's where the began his work. And then he went to, U, uh, just to finish uh, the story of uh, his life, he went to the United States to work in the laboratory of a guy that I showed you yesterday, which uh, Raymond Pearl. It, and, uh, the, and actually, he never got a position as a professor, uh, a permanent position in professor in the United States. But he uh, uh, moved on to become a statistician. He was then the president of the American Statistical Society, and he worked and, and became rich because statistics gives you a lot of money if you work with, I mean, insurances and so on. So he... So, okay, this is the story about these two guys. We are very different guys, and they didn't... And they, they have never met. So, we need two... We need two... Uh, 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 two uh, functions, let's say N, the number of predators, and V, the number of prey. So V, uh, if you want to remember V, it's the victims. Okay? And uh, in what follows, all the constants are always positive. So what we, how will we build the, mo the model? So we will say that the prey, in the absence of the predator, grows exponentially. Okay? So, you would say, why not logistic? Because 
this is simpler. With logistic things, I will comment if you put up logistic words. Okay? Then you say, you have DVDT here. <laughs> and you say that this was uh, some A times V. Okay? So if you, if you divide this by V, this says that the, this is the Malthus law for the victims, for the, for the prey. And you say, the presence of the predator is such that this per capita growth rate of the prey will be smaller and smaller proportional to the number of predators. Okay? So then I put one minus some other constant. So it would be A minus uh, B times P. So it's proportional to the to the to the number number of prey. Okay? So this gives you these equations. Right? Okay. Now you multiply by B here. You have this is the equation for the prey. So if you are not a mathematician or not trained in mathematics, so pay attention. It's the equation for V, but it depends on P. So it's, you cannot solve this equation per se. It's not possible to solve because you don't know P. You don't know the number of predators. So you need an equation for the predators, and hmm? oh, yeah, yeah. P is n. P equal n. Yeah. P is the predators. I I changed this. Let me see. Yeah. Everything is with P. Yeah, everything is with P. Okay. P is the predators. It's the n. Okay. Forget the. Uh, I, um, I made the same mistake last year. <laughs> so, P is, the, is, is, P is the number of predators, okay? So, the equation for the number of predators, we will suppose that this predator uh, decreases exponentially in the absence of prey. So this means what, biologically? That this predator is a specialist on the prey. Without the prey, it cannot reproduce. Cannot, it will only die. So this is one point which is important. We are talking about a, sp a specialist predator. Okay? We could have other things, a generalist, which had, could have many preys, but we're looking for a case of a specialist predator. So, in the absence of prey, it has only a negative growth term, and now you say the presence of prey, in the same way I discussed this here, if I just put this equal to minus g, okay? So, the presence of the prey increases the, the amount of predators in a linear way. Okay? So I used uh, C plus C times V. Okay? So now you multiply this by P, you get this equation there. Okay? So now we have two equations for two variables. You have V and you have P, and the equations are such that they, they are Coupled. You cannot solve one equation and then the other. You have to solve them both at the, at the same time. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. If it's if you can define sometimes you can define a, a, a kind of a super species thing. Okay. And uh, so let's but let's just discuss what are the biological assumptions we are doing, putting here. So first is the idea that the predator is a specialist, that the, the prey will grow exponentially in the absence of predators, which means that we are looking at a system where the regulation of the population of prey will be made by the predator. The predator 
well, will be the reason for not having the exponential explosion of, of the number of prey. And second, look at the spray here, the, the, the equation for the prey, okay? So, if I have, uh, say, V and uh, or this, this is this this per capita growth rate is linear in V. So if I have a certain amount of prey and I double it, I double the uh, uh, increase uh, the rate of increase of the population. And I can in ten times, then I have ten times uh, faster growth and so on. So there is no satiation. There's no satiation. You put, it's like I give you 10 hamburgers here, you eat all the time, I put you 1,000, and you also, are the pre this predator would also eat all the 1,000. Okay? There's no satiation, and there's no, uh, uh, there's no limitation for the consumption of prey. It means that, for instance, usually what you would expect that there's uh, some handling time for the prey. Okay? That you have to uh, 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 handle. I mean, you have to. There's some time to eat the prey, right? And then usually they get satiated and so on. And then only later on you will have a new predation event. So this is not in the model, okay? This is not in the model. But there are models, and I will discuss on the blackboard at the end how to, how to get how to have models that include this. Okay? So, but now we have a system of equations and we want to study the system of equations and we have very nice solutions. We do not know their solution. Again, these equations have solutions. What does it mean? It means that if I give initial conditions, there will be only one solution for the system. Okay? So it's a well-behaved system of equations. For, okay? There will be a solution, but we cannot write down the solutions for uh, 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 in terms of functions that we know. Right? So trigonometric, exponential, logarithms, we cannot write down the solutions in terms of these functions. But as I stressed yesterday, and I will stress again, this is not a problem for the equations or for the method. It's a problem of your knowledge, what you consider a known function. Okay? This is it's it's a human problem. It's not a mathematical problem. Okay? So you don't have the solutions in terms of known functions, but the solutions exist, and uh, in in this case, it's more than exist, and they they, they are. This is a well-behaved uh, uh, system. So if you don't know what, uh, what is a well-behaved system, it's like that. So first, you could ask yourself the following question. I give you a system of equations. Not Voltaire, or other systems of equations, OK? Then usually people would say, ah, maybe I can find one solution, OK? If you can find one solution, this is not the same as saying that you have a re uh, uh, the general solution. Usually, one solution doesn't corresponds to one particular initial condition. And th if you have a different initial condition, the solution is not uh, not a solution anymore. Therefore, it's it's kind of of no value for that. Okay, no practical application for one solution. You want the general solution given to initial values for p and for b. I want to have the general solution. So we cannot write it uh, analytically, but this uh, you can show mathematically that this exists, and given the initial conditions, they, these solutions are unique. Okay? So means what is important. If you give one initial condition for P and for V, then there's only one solution for that, in, okay? which is important. If there were two, then you would say, well, which one is then is, is the one of, of nature, okay? So it's, it's important to be unique. So, very well. So the, uh, 
we can do, there are two ways. There's numerical integration, so go for numerics, and you will know what is numerics today, 6 p.m., okay? How to solve on the computer and what it is. So I don't want to talk about this now because we'll spend a lot of time with that. But uh, there's also qualitative analysis, which is the thing I told you yesterday, which is getting the main uh, trends, the main the behavior of the solutions without having the solutions. And we will go for that. Okay? So now, here comes a more mathematical uh, part. So if you have problems with math, you just, OK, don't, don't get despaired. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't follow the demonstration, the proof of what I will uh, show you, you can get back in 10 minutes and to follow the rest, okay? So, in order to study these equations, then uh, we have these equations, and what we will do is simply divide one by the other. Okay. So, can you always do this? No, but for, for well-behaved equations, this is, in practice, something that you can do, and it's, it's it is justified by mathematical. Uh, that, that, that's a how you say it? It, it's kind of uh, uh, making short a, a long mathematical passage. Okay, so you can divide the first one by the other and cancel the dt. Okay, so if I divide one by the other, I get this. Okay, uh, uh, the, I divided the second by the first. Okay. So I took this one and divided by this one. This gives you dp dv is equal to this. Okay? Yeah, I just cancelled the dt's. Okay? I did this one. You see this this part of the expression is here, and the other part here from the v equation is here. So now I can manipulate that, and it's not difficult. And I can write this in this way. I have, uh, let me do it here. Where is that? <laughs> so, what you do is you have deep, you put deep, dp on this side and you put dv on the other side. And then you divide, you, you take this p, put it here, okay? Um, and this one, this part of the expression, you put it above here, a minus bp. Okay, that's the first one, and the other one is the same uh, reasoning, which is this. Now, this is nice. This depends only on P, and this depends only on V. And now I can integrate both sides. And as this equation is sufficiently uh, nice and easy to, to work, it is possible to find these integrals, the, the primitives, you can find them. Okay. If the equations were more complicated, you maybe could not do this. Okay. So, so you have done this, and what you get, you integrate both sides. You get the integrals. Okay, here uh, you have uh, the, uh, the first one is an uh, integral of a t over p, which gives you a logarithm minus b p, and here you have this, and at the end. Of the integration, you have an arbitrary constant, which is called h. It's an arbitrary constant, which is fixed by the initial conditions. Given the initial conditions, you get head. you get the, the arbitrary constant. So now, magic. It's not a differential equation anymore. It's not. Okay, so it is a relation between p and v. It's, so I don't have 
p as a function of time. I don't have v as a function of time, but I have a relation between p and v such that this the solutions are such that always this thing is valid. Okay? So for physicists or mathematicians, it's kind of first integral. But the point is, I don't have any more a differential equation. I have a relation, it's not algebraic because of the logarithm, but it's, it's an equation which relates P and V. Now, good. you say, okay, fine, you are kind of magician, disappeared with the differential equations and got something else. So what do I do with something else, okay? So, uh, okay, that's ag again the same thing. Here, uh, you see, uh, oops, what happened to my thing? Yeah. Okay. This means that V and P are such that this expression here is always a constant. Right? Now, now I can do the following. For each value, possible value of, of the arbitrary constant h, I can draw the geometric locus of the solutions p and v in a plane p, v. What does it mean? I will have. I have something like that. I make the axes are P and V. Right? And I can draw the lines that obey this, this, this law. Okay? I can do this. Right? They obey this law. Okay? So you can do this with your favorite software which will plot you this, you get a plot, but you get one curve for every value of, of the integration constant. Okay? But the integration constant is anything, so I will draw some of the, of the, of the, uh, the lines, okay? And they will look like, oops, come on, this. So each curve, okay, it is V per P. Each curve corresponds to one particular initial condition. And what this is saying is that, say I started somewhere here on this curve, this solution will stay on this curve or if you want orbit, it will stay there. So it will, I don't have the function p and I don't have the function v. I know that p and v are variables okay, in time. Nothing tells me that they are constants, okay? But they will stay on this curve. Therefore, they will kind of run on the curve, okay? They will circulate here. And for each condition, each initial condition, I have a curve, okay? So this is the, what people call the phase uh, space or the phase portrait of the solutions of the logical voltaire equations. Now we want an interpretation. Okay? So this is what I call qualitative analysis. I didn't solve the equation, okay? but I got a phase portrait. And from this, you will see we'll have a lot of information. So, well, and so the first thing is, what does it mean? Okay, uh, let me use the previous one. What does it mean? So, stay, say you are here, and at a certain point here, okay, on this curve. As time goes on, you will be moving on this curve, okay? And so you will go on, and you will circulate, and after some time, you will be back to the point of depart of your starting point. Therefore, you have a, a 
periodic solution. You start with some values of P and V, and after some time, which we will call the period, you have, again, the same solution. And this happens for all the curves and all the points. Therefore, you have solutions that are periodic. Okay. So, but more than this, yeah. No, maybe they are, I mean, they have to correspond to possible initial conditions, uh, which, uh, because you have to pay attention to the, that V and P are always uh, positive. Okay. So th this is also a, a thing that you have to know when you do modeling in general. Populations are positive, yes, or zero, huh? okay, are, are non-negative. Now, you build your models in the afternoon, you get a negative value. Your model is wrong, plainly wrong. No negative populations. If you say, no, maybe there is something, no, 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 it's wrong. It's wrong. Your model is wrong. But pay attention. Sometimes it's your, your, the way you are solving may be wrong. And numerics is not OK. Then you get solutions that are negative, but that, that, that's a problem of you are not solving correctly. But if you solve correctly and you get a negative value, your model is wrong. You just throw it away. It's not good. Okay? No. No, no way. There are no negative populations. Okay, there's no way. Yeah, but maybe let's negotiate here. No, it's wrong. Okay. So now, but we want more. I told you that it is periodic. Therefore, I have a situation, and I will have after some period again the same situation, the same population. But how does it go on? So let us look here at one of the curves. Let me start at a certain point here and say we are going this way on the solution, okay? So here, the number of, when I go from here to the next uh, part of the curve, the number of prey is increasing and then, and the number of predators is also increasing because you make the projections, okay, you have a curve like that. You are here, means that you have a certain number of prey, and you have a certain number of predators. Then you go to this place, the number of prey increases, the number of predators also increases. Okay? But when you go on this part here, what is happening here? The number of prey is decreasing, but the number of predators is still increasing. When you go to this place, the number of prey is decreasing. Yeah? You take one point he uh, prey here, next time it is smaller. And the number of predators also decreases. And then when you come to this point, the number of prey increases, and the number of predators still decreases until you get back to the thing. So if you look now, say, only for prey, Okay, prey was increasing, decreasing, the projection on V, and then increasing again. Decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing, it's an oscillation. Okay? It oscillates, it grows, decreases, grows, decreases, grows, decreases. So it's an oscillation. It's a periodic oscillation. Okay? The same is valid for P as well for V, okay? So the population is oscillating, okay? So, uh, where is my pointer? Yeah. Okay. So, very nice. So, you have oscillations, okay? So this is on exactly what I told you here. And this system is therefore periodic and oscillating. Um, okay, yeah, this is just what I wrote on the blackboard, okay? This is exactly the same thing. So, now you'd say, okay, that's, that's a lot of, of cheap talk, because you have the equations. We want to see the solutions. You don't show us the solutions. You're just 
playing around with equations, and you are getting information. But you told us at the very beginning that there are solutions. Can't you present solutions for me? I want the solutions now. Okay? I understand that there will be oscillations and they are, will be periodic. But I want the function p and I want the function v. So this you can do by numerically integrating the equations. If you don't know what is, this is, it's a kind of magic that you will learn and you will be able to make numerical integrations uh, at 6 p.m. At 8 p.m. you are working with numerical integration. That's the promise. So, uh, so uh, the real thing uh, is, um, here it's a um, sketchy one, you have a hair in the, in, in the, uh, in the links for predator of a prey, you see, this is the solution. It's the, it's, it's the, all solutions have this, more or less, this, this form. So you have an oscillation, and you see first you have the increase of prey, and then later you have the increase of predators. And then you have the decrease of uh, prey, and later on the decrease of predators, and then again the increase of prey, and then the decrease and increase and decrease. Okay, so does it make sense? Yeah, sure. First, you have you have a lot of prey. Okay, when you have the prey, there's a lot of prey. The prey say it's it's increasing. You have a certain number of predators, and the the, the predator deplete the increase of the population of prey and increases the population of predators and then you have a lot of predation so you have a very strong predator pressure which will deplete the number of prey therefore the prey will become will start to decay but once they start to decay there are less prey for the predators and there's not enough prey to sustain a, a large predator uh, population, the population of predators will decrease because there are not enough prey. But once the population of predator decreases, means that the predation pressure on the prey is smaller and, and there's a release of, of predation and therefore the prey can grow again. And then it grows again and then there are the predators will also grow because there are a lot of prey, and this repeats itself. Okay? So there are oscillations, and they make sense biologically in this. Uh, they make sense biologically with the assumptions that we have made. Uh, specialist predator, no saturation, no satiation, no handling time, exponential growth of. of of um, of uh, prey, all of the simplifying assumptions, but they take us to the conclusion that the solutions of this model behave as um, oscillations, periodic oscillations of prey and predators, and this corresponds to this what I just was telling you about the release of predation pressure and the uh, increase of predation pressure and so on. So that makes a kind of biologically, biological sense to think about this. Now, uh, okay, this is just what I told you. So then you could ask you one very dangerous question. We have a model. We have the oscillation. Okay. Can we check the model with data? Okay. Oh, yeah. There. So you you start with a with a problem, because I have only two species, and I uh, uh, have a specialist guy, and so on. There are many many assumptions, and it's difficult maybe to find this in nature. Okay. So, oops. <laughs> but, and moreover, and this is 
something general about models and theory in ecology and evolution and so on. Moreover, uh, you don't have exact numbers for populations. Okay? So let me repeat what I told you yesterday. I told you that populations are inferred from observations in the field. So you don't have the exact number. Say you have hair and links in the, in, the, uh, in the north of Canada, which is a classic example of oscillations. Uh, so, but do you know the exact number? You don't know the exact number, okay? You have to have some inference. Some inference means a lot of statistics, which means a lot of possibilities of, of having uh, errors. You have measurement error, you have other errors like uh, system, um, uh, system errors. So, you never have in ecology or in related science, which are essentially observational, uh, you, have, you don't have really precise values. Huh? And this is a problem, because you have a model, a model gives you a certain solution. You can try to fit the model and so on, and people do this. Okay? But it's, it's not like physics. Physics, you have equations, they give you a prediction with, uh, uh, with very high precision, and you go to the lab and you have this precision in the lab and you can get this. So this is not the case anymore. So that's out of question. So you will never say have a real verification of, of the equations in the field. But then you would say, why are these equations? Okay, you cannot go for the experimental verification, but aren't these equations worth anything? I mean, why do you have this equation? What what can I can I do? Which is give me some scientific uh, information that is uh, valuable. So we found something here that is very important, actually. Because you can go out to the field. And yesterday, our populations increased and saturated and went to, with the logistic equation, everything went to a constant value, okay? So, then I told you, but populations in the real world are not necessarily constant. They oscillate. They have a lot of dynamical behavior. And there are many sources of, of reasons why uh, populations may change their size. So, maybe let me ask you, give me some reasons why a population of any species you think about would change in time. The population increases, decreases, oscillates, whatever. Why would they change in time? Why do they, are not all of them constants? So, give me some ideas. So, seasonality is one. Hmm? Breeding seasonality. Okay, but in this case, what you expect is oscillations with period one year. Okay, if it's seasonal. Everything which is seasonal, will induce a period of one year, you expect. Hmm? I didn't... Uh, hmm? Plague. Uh, yeah, pests, I mean. Yeah, so there can be interactions with pests. So interacting populations can induce you to have... Um, to have... Uh, variable for populations, okay? Hmm? Environmental, yes. So there was a long discussion in, I think this is 50s. There was a famous conference in Cold Spring Harbor, I think in the 50s. And all, all the big names from population ecology were there. Hutchinson, and all, all people also from genetics, like uh, Dobchansky, everything. It, it, this was kind of very important event. And one of the main discussions is how are populations regulated? So this kind of regulation is what we call density-dependent regulation. That's the jargon of ecology. It means that this is 
a regulation that is not dependent on the environment. You have here, what we have found, and which is very important, is there are oscillations which are intrinsic to the dynamics of the species and are not dependent on the environment. Because one way of having oscillations is environment oscillating and inducing oscillations, and not only oscillations, modifications in general of the populations. Right? That's true. It can also happen. So there was a long discussion of the importance of density dependence in ecology in the 50s. Right? And there were people, um, uh, a guy called Andra Varta, which, which was a very, very, very important uh, proponent of, uh, of uh, density dependence and other people that said, no, it, it, in, in the practice, in the field, we will not say the, see the density dependence, we will see the environmental uh, uh, modification, environmental oscillations are such that all the density dependence will be blurred and uh, maybe it exists but we won't observe. So there was a long discussion and this discussion that that is sometimes still present. So when you see oscillations you want to know why do I see the oscillations and this is not kind of that I give you one answer. Predator prey dynamics is oscillatory, okay? and uh, therefore there are oscillations, and there is no reason for these oscillations to have the period of one year. It can be any number, the period can be anything. Okay? So, uh, uh, therefore, if you have oscillations which are not from one year, you can have oscillations uh, of, any, of any, uh, any period, you could at least suspect predator-prey dynamics, which was actually the problem that Lotka, Voltaire, Lotka, uh, not Lotka, Vito Voltaire faced in Italy when he met a guy who is called Umberto Nancona, that he, he worked at fish uh, stocks and at fisheries, and they had oscillations, which were a period of things like Three, three and a half years. So it's not even commensurate with, with, with one year. Okay, it's not a multiple of one year. So, so he said, well, I, I don't understand. Okay, and then the explanation comes from interaction between uh, sharks and the the fish that they were fishing, and then you have this kind of population dynamics oscillating naturally without external things. So this is the importance of the. Not a couple of equation. It's not like I have the model, I go to the lab, and I see exactly this model. But means populations oscillate. Okay. So nice. Uh, but as always, we have the glory and the misery of our models. Uh, that the glory is just what I told you. I mean, if we sh I stop this lecture here, you would say Lotka Volterra model is the best model that you could ever think in your life. It explains all oscillations in the nature. It's very nice, and so on, so on. But are there miseries? And yes, there are so many miseries. I will spend half an hour about the miseries. <laughs> and um, so, what are the miseries? The first thing is, well, we won't blame Lotka Volterra model for things that we did wrong. We did wrong with him. We did not consider all the biological factors. Okay? So we can now say, I want to, to, to take into account uh, satiation of the predator. I have to write a new model. And I don't know what will happen with the new model. So I can tell you what will happen. Actually, you will have also oscillations. So, but there's one thing that, that you'd say, okay, if Lotka Volterra model is, takes really the essence of predator prey dynamics, all predator prey dynamics should be oscillatory. Go to the field. Is it true? No. <laughs> there are fixed levels also of predators and prey. It's not all predators and prey that oscillate. Actually, it's, it's a minority of predator prey dynamics that oscillates. So we should have a better model that 
allows, according to the values of the parameters of the model, either fixed populations, constant populations, either oscillating populations. Right? Should have a better model. That can we do this? I will then just write some sketches on the blackboard. And but there has there is uh, something which is really really miserable, and it's a mathematical point. Okay, and let me show you the misery. So on the blackboard, on the blackboard. So say you have your P and V phase plane, and you have your curves, okay? So Lotka-Volterra equations have this kind of curves, yes? Okay? Like that, okay? Now, first thing. Say I have an initial condition, set a number of prey and set a number of predators here. And it's cycling. It's going on this. It has a certain period. Yeah? So it has a period, let's say T1. Okay? Now say I have a different locations with the same species and I have a different number of I have a different initial condition. Say I have an initial condition which lies on this one, on this curve. Okay? So it will be cycling here, and it has a period. And this period I should call T2. Okay? So is T2 equal to T1? No, it's not. Each curve has a different period. Means that I should observate for the same species oscillating in different places, different periods. But this is usually not true. So where I'm, uh, the best opportunity is to observate this kind of oscillations? Well, you better don't have too much interaction so that you can single out the predator-prey interaction. So you don't want a lot of interactions. Where could you go? When you have in the very cold areas of the world. So you go to the north of Canada, okay? Like, it's, 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 there are a lot of species also, but you can single out the usual cases, the lynx and the hare, okay? Which oscillate in time, okay? So this is the classical example of predator-prey oscillations. It's debated. It's highly debated. There are people saying that it's not a predator-prey equation. It's, it's something else, and so on. And the, and they, but they have a time series of like 100 years, uh, which is nice. Okay? You, you could ask yourself, how do they get a time series of 100 years of the number of predators, of, of lynx, and of hare in, in Canada? How, I mean, what would you, how would you get this data? So first, I told you, data are always inferred. You, you, there's no such thing as, as marking all the animals and going there and following that. Okay? And so this was because these, these animals were hunted and, you could, uh, and were sold. Okay? And uh, you, so you have the, the, the data of the companies that, that bought the, the, the animals. And this is a proxy of the number of of uh, of animals, okay, but this is a very very say ugly data. It's really really difficult because it depends on the on the on the predation or the hunting pressure. Uh, people could be more interested in a certain certain years more interested in hunting than in other years, which would give you oscillations which are induced by the hunting predation. So, so there's a lot of thing about this data that is being discussed. But okay, but one thing about this is, which is important, is if you go to different parts of Canada, these oscillations have the same period. And that's also true to, for some species, lemnings in, 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 I think, in northern Sweden or, 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 or Finland, something, 
in the Scandinavia, you have oscillations of different uncoupled populations, which are separated, but they have the same period. And this is not predicted by logical Volterra equation. Logical Volterra equation is you have not, no preferred period. It depends on the initial condition. It depends on how much, uh, on the level of the populations. So, this means that it's really a misery for the logical Volterra equation that it has no preferred period. Well, second, no mathematical. There is no such thing as a population isolated. There is always noise and random events that may decrease or increase the population dramatically during a very short time period of time. Right? So some disasters or some something. Okay? Therefore, there's no such thing that following exactly this. You will be jumping actually. Okay? Now, say you started here on this curve. You are following this and then something happens and you go here. And then next you go to something here and then you go back to this one and then you go to this one and so on. If, if your observation time is long enough and this and these uh, random events happen enough, uh, I mean, happen often, what you will see will not be something which do, does exactly this. It will be, there will be some rem something like something periodic, but actually there's no, no real oscillation anymore. Because you go from one, one curve with a certain period, then you go to the other curve, which is a different period, and you will end up without any periodic solutions, actually. They don't have a period. Because each, one, each time you, do, you go for a circle here, you will be jumping between different curves, and therefore, the whole by behavior of oscillations, of periodic oscillations, is non observable in this case. Because the because there is no such thing as a preferred period. The period for each curve is different. So, in nature, you would prefer to have oscillations which, given a certain species in a certain place, okay, given the same environmental conditions, that there the oscillation of a certain pair of species have a, a fixed period. Okay? So this, this would be compatible with saying if I go to the west of Canada or the east of Canada, they have the same period. This means that it would have this a preferred period. An oscillation that is, uh, is such that always the period is the same. So this would be very nice to have a model that has a preferred period. So we are very much uh, acquainted with the idea of preferred period. So in our everyday life, we have a pref something which has a preferred period and something which if this period, if this were a Lotka dynamic, Lotka Volterra dynamics, you would be really in, in danger. So, can somebody tell me about periods in our everyday life? Hmm? The heartbeat. Exactly. The heartbeat. Yeah, you have a preferred heartbeat. It means that if, if your heart were a Lotka Volterra guy, you would be here. And then you run, and your heartbeat goes to uh, 150. Okay? Okay? You run to 150. But you are then you are on the other period here. You would not go back to your preferred one, you would stay with 150. Okay? So every, every time you would 
there would not be the heartbeat at rest. Okay? There wouldn't be no, which is a, a certain period. You can perturb the system, go away. Okay? So you get, ah. Uh, but once the perturbation goes away, you go back to your heartbreak. You don't stay with a different heartbeat. Okay? And so this is, is, a, is, a, is a different kind of oscillations. It's not a lot of pair oscillations. It's called a limit cycle. Limit cycle oscillation. Okay? And now, how would it be a face portrait of a limit cycle oscillation? How would this be? A limit cycle oscillation should be something where you have a preferred cycle. So you have some, let's say you have predators and prey. Well, this is it's valid even if it's not predator prey, it's just a mathematical thing, okay? So, and you would expect to have an oscillation here, which is the preferred one. Say, if you think about your heartbeat, this is an oscillation with your normal heartbeat at rest. And you perturb this and you say, okay, this is a, is a, a solution of my equations. I didn't write the equations for the moment. But what would be a limit cycle and how does, should the face portrait be if you have a limit cycle and if you are able to write a model for predator prey dynamics which has limit cycles. So you say, now I start with a certain given initial condition. Say you are here. Okay? So you are not on the cycle. But when I say it's a preferred cycle, it's kind of a tractor. It will go on in this circle and get as close as you want to the limit cycle. And if you are inside here, it will circle out and also go for the limit cycle. Okay? So this is a limit cycle oscillation. And the phase part it should be something like that. Not like the Volta Volterra model, which has this separated cycles. Each of them has its own period. And here, what you expect is you, you start with an oscillation. You have some transient until you get close to the limit cycle. And once you are in the limit cycle, you have a certain preferred, uh, uh, a preferred um, uh, 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 period. And this is what would be desirable if you want to descri describe populations in the field when you see, as I told you, the lynx and the hare in northern Canada oscillate with a certain given period in different places which are not connected. So there is something intrinsic. Okay? So there should be something like that. Now, we have discussed the lotka voltaire equations. And we have put into the block of equations very, very few biological effects. We have just the exponential growth of the prey in the absence of the predator. And we have the decline of the predator in the absence of prey. And we have these, uh, these forms of the equations. Uh, if you remember, you have, say, dv dt. V is the prey, yes. So it has a certain increase, uh, a exponential increase, minus something, I, I think I put a b here, uh, which is v times p. Okay? So we have assumed this form here, which is the uh, mass action form from, from chemistry, and uh, which told you, if you again divide by v here, that per capita growth rate of the prey is, uh, is a constant uh, in the absence of the predator and decreases linearly with the, with the number of predators. And for the predator equations, we had also something similar. So, so that's the biology have, we have put into this, and we arrived at the lotka volterra equations, which gives you the nice result that predator predator dynamics can have cycles, intrinsic cycles, but on the other hand, it are non these are non realistic cycles okay but 
But the age is, 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 is would be this uh, means that the populations are the same size. Because age depends on initial conditions. And you have should be on the on the same on the same this would be I mean unlikely. And if you look for other cases of oscillations in nature, then you would also say uh, there's n there's not such thing as age in biological terms. It's it's a, a constant of integration of the equations, but it it is if you want it's a label for the for uh, for the the curve you are. Okay. There's no. Uh, I already tried to f <laughs> to find a kind of interpretation of age. But you know, you get a logarithm. You think about entropy or something. But I never got any any real interpretation, and I never saw an interpretation actually. And actually, this law, you know, it is this law between p and v, which allowed us to draw this can be obtained only for the logical voltaire equation. If you now modify the logical voltaire equation, this doesn't work anymore. Okay. So <coughs> now, so the biology is simple. If what would be the obvious biological fact that we could put into the the system, well the first thing is say, come on. <laughs> Exponential growth of the prey. There is no such thing. There should be at least a logistic. Okay, I can, I can agree with that. And therefore, we would say that dv dt should be something like some. I will use r v one v over k, and then minus some some constant b v times p. Okay, and no, and for the predator, it's minus g times p plus c times vp, which is the same equation as before, the same term as before, just this. What is the long time behavior of the solutions of this model? It's a fixed point, no oscillations. I mean, you get oscillations with damped. The, the, the you have the V times P. You have something like that. You have a fixed point. You start here. You go and you go to the fixed point. You don't go to a cycle. So you will have and the solutions will look like this. Okay, a solution would be something like. A oscillation that damps out and gets to a constant value. But we liked oscillations. We didn't want them to go away, <laughs> okay? Because that was a very important point about Lotka Volterra. So I just put this into the, the here, and I'm coming to the conclusion that there are no oscillation anymore. There is only some damped oscillations, okay? Well, well, uh, so. More biology. And one way of putting more biology is now looking at these terms. Okay? So you can modify, this is related directly to the predation. Right? These terms can be modified in such a way to represent the saturation of predation or the satiation of the predator and the, hand, and the fact that the, there's a handling time. Okay? I don't have time to make uh, a, a, a demonstration of this. How you can obtain mechanistically, uh, if, you, if you Google for a guy called Holling, you will see demonstration in the, the book of um, uh, of, of ecology, of uh, the primer of ecology of um, Gotelli, there is this discussion about how to obtain uh, uh, an equation which takes into account satiation. And actually, it is a modification of this term where you get something like, oh, is there a square root? No, there's no square root. Uh, 1 minus some constant 
times v here and the same thing here. Is it correct? I, I didn't take a note of that. Uh, let me see if, um, if p is constant. Yeah, I think that's it. So uh, this means the following. At, at, uh, this does not increase indefinitely with v, OK? So v, without this, the number of prey consumed by, by one predator would be proportional to v. Okay? The number of prey consumed by one predator would be dv dt, 1 over p. Okay? It would be proportional to this. And in the Lotka Volterra model, this is just a constant time v. Therefore, if I double the number of prey, I have the consumption of the double number of prey by the predator. The predator is, is, is infinite uh, uh, capacity of eating, of consuming. So then you will say, OK, maybe I put something better here, like 1 minus some constant times v. And when v is large, this goes to a constant value, OK? Which is b, b over, oh, no, there's a plus sign. A plus sign, there's no minus, plus sign here. So, so this goes. Uh, this this uh, uh, this goes to a constant. So this is more or less a way of understanding that when the number of prey is very large, you go to a constant predation rate, okay, which is more reasonable. Uh, if you do this, you get a limit cycle, okay. But you don't get only a limit cycle. So it will be dependent on the parameters. So because the predator is not lim it, it 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 depends only it's a, it's a specialist. It depends only on the prey. If I put a uh, current capacity, it would mean that I would take into account, for instance, it depends on prey, but also on space or other uh, on the prey and water, uh, some other thing that it depends also upon. So if you want, you can do this, but we are sticking here to the idea that we have a uh, Specialist and the specialist depends only on the prey. Therefore, the all limits for for uh, for this this uh, predator are given by the availability of prey, which is taken into account. Okay. Uh, here, actually, I'm saying that now the prey has a twofold regulation. Without this term, you have Lotka Voltaire, or, or you have this thing, and the prey in the absence of predator would grow indefinitely. So the only reason the predator does not go indefinitely in the equations is because of the predator. When I put this here, I say there's a second regulation. There's something, maybe it's some basic uh, nutrient that is also important for the prey which is a limiting factor for the growth of the prey. For actually, now I have taken into account one more, if you want, species, which is a secret species, which is regulating the, uh, the ability of the prey to grow. Right? So it's, 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 um, the prey is not only regulated by the predator, now it has a twofold. So, very nice equation. They have even a name. Okay. So when equations have a name, they are usually important. Yeah. So this is the Rosenzweig, MacArthur equations, and the the phase plane is like that. It depends on the combination of constants. But to make things simple, 
I will look for k. Okay. So if k is large, you have limit cycles. Okay. So the dynamics is such that you approach the cycle. Now, the size of the cycle depends on k. And there is a critical value of k, of the current capacity, such that the cycle disappears and becomes a point, and you have oscillations which go to a fixed point and not to a limit cycle. So you have two regimes. One is oscillating, and the other one is damped oscillation tending to a constant value, depending on on the combination of all of these constants, but the easiest way is to look for k. Large carrying capacity induces cycles. Small carrying capacity dumps the cycles and creates fixed points. Okay. So, this is the basic of Rosenzweig, Mercator. Um, 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 equations. So I didn't. You you could ask me why did you not take these equations and made a full qualitative analysis in order to obtain what you are telling me? Because I'm ha I'm asking you, please believe in me. Okay. I'm telling you, you have to believe. I didn't show you. Okay. I didn't make a demonstration. I didn't make any any reasoning that. But, well, there, there are two reasons. Uh, the first one, it would take a long time. And second, it, it is a little bit more difficult than the lot couple terra equations in order to obtain these results. Okay? So, but here you have, this is, would be the standard model of predator-prey dynamics nowadays. Okay? If you, you want, you see a, 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 a modeling paper about predator and prey, blah, 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 I usually would take, okay, let's take the Rosen-Zweig MacArthur equation, because this is, 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 is sufficiently realistic, but still sufficiently general about predation, okay? Um, oops. Come on. Okay, so this is uh, just uh, writing down what I just told you. So, this has importance for your project also. Okay? You will have to decide if you have predator prey or consumer reserves dynamics, okay, beyond predation, strict to sensor. If you want to take into account the effects of saturation or not, if they are important or not for your models. Okay. So, and here I will finish with a mathematical aside, which is the following. You know, nice, P times V, and all what you saw with the Lotka Voltaire and the Rosenzweig MacArthur equation is that solutions either go to a fixed point or to a limit cycle. Or to a cycle, okay, limit or not. Okay? It go they cycle or they go to fixed points. They could also go blow away. Okay? But you could say, isn't it possible that there's just some erratic behavior which is not a fixed point and not a cycle? or modifications of the population, oscillations of the population, which are not periodic, they won't come back to the same point. Okay? Why isn't there something like that? Let me put here. Why isn't something that starts here, then goes here, then goes here, then goes here, then goes here, and wanders here, goes around wandering, and never crosses itself, and therefore it's not uh, anymore. It's not periodic. Well, why? Could this be true? Would it be possible? Okay. So there's a very, very nice mathematical theorem called the Poincaré-Bendixson uh, theorem, which says that if you have 
a system of two differential equations. Pay attention, two, not three, two. Two differential equations, or ordinary differential equations, which is called a planar system because it's on two dimension plane, such that you can show that the solutions never go to infinity. You can try to show this, and it's usually more or less easy to show that the solutions are bounded. Okay? Then, the long time behavior of your, of your solutions, it's either a cycle or a fixed point. No other kinds of solutions which is called no chaos in two dimension because an oscillating solution that never returns to itself to the same values which is oscillating but non-periodic it would be it is one way of having chaos in in in, in, in equations okay so and the point is, this theorem, the poincare bendixson theorem, is valid only in two equations. Three equations, you can have chaotic dynamics and the hell, essentially. Okay? So that's a mathematical aside, because it's uh, nice to mention the poincare bendixson And the life on, on a two-dimensional flat Earth here, <laughs> Okay, has no no great fun. Cycles and fixed points. That's it. Okay. So that is everything for today. Um, you have the same, essentially the same uh, references. If you want to take a look at the references, you just tell me. I have the books in my office, and so. That's for today, and tomorrow we'll study competitions. Now, so before we finish, let me tell the following. Now you go back to your group projects, which is the most important part of the school, as I will stress every day. Eh? So your projects. Now, yesterday was pretty fun. Yeah? I mean, everybody could give a presentation. I was really glad and give a presentation and understood what is the, the system, what is, why is the system interesting, why are the, the questions and so on. So today, you will, we would expect that you begin to define what, what biology or what effects will go into your model. In the sense that, you know, the field, model, observations, have lots of details, lots of details, and you, you want now to focus on what is really important for the problems I want to address in, the, in my project, and then maybe write down some equations and see and play with the equations. We don't want you to, we don't expect you to have a model to do, a, a final model today. Experience shows that People that write, will, many of you will write down a model today. And experience shows that tomorrow you will erase this model because it's wrong. It's always like that. There's a kind of cycle. The simple model, then you say, okay, oh, this is wrong. Then you go for something else and something else. And, but be sure, and on Saturday you will have something. Okay? But so today's idea is to play with equations a little bit. But first of all, very important. What is what is the question that we want to address with a model? And what are the biological factors that are important that should be in the model, which I cannot discard? What is not essential, discard. But you have to know what are the essential things that you don't want to discard and you want to have in your model. What are the variables, what are the effects, and so on. Okay? So, that's it. So, good work. And today, at 6 p.m., Renato, Renato Coutinho, will give you a class about numerical integrations, uh, like from the scratch, like how, what are the languages I use, Python, R, how to install this on your computer, and 
then there are some tutorials about what is numerical integration, what is, and how to implement that in your computer in a very easy way, in such a way that in order to study your equations, you will only be, be necessary to, to change the equations that Renato writes and change, put your equations there, because th this is very simple thing. I mean, I mean, solving ordinary differential equations on a computer, except for cases when you have singularities of very, very ugly things, usually is very easy and can be done for very large system of equations in kind of one second. Good. So, good work.